Hey, Bob. Hey, Tony. I heard you had the new Dolby Atmos surround system set up in your home. Yes. And wanted to take a look at that today to see how you put that together. Sure, absolutely. This is the digital front end of it. Of course, everything with mm -hmm. Atmos is going to be digital. The front end of this is an M1 Mac Mini. Okay. And uh, here's a DVD drive for Blu-ray drive for ripping and that kind of stuff. And then some storage, extra storage, and some extra interface from so other world computing. Thunderbolt dock there. Thunderbolt dock. Storage. Right. Okay. And then this is the Moat U 24AO, which is uh, 24 channels of balanced amplifier, but we're going to only use 12. The system is 7.1.4. And the dot four is what confuses people. So 7.1 is like a surround system. There's seven speakers around the floor, mm -hmm. two in the front, one in the center, left and right sides, left and right rears. The dot one, of course, is a subwoofer. Okay. And the dot four is four in ceiling speakers for the verticals. That's the big thing that Atmos does is it, it creates what I call a snow globe in your house or that, that bubble by giving you the, the vertical height speakers. Happen. So, and sometimes they have them, they reflect up off this thing. In this case, we actually have the speakers actually in the ceiling. So, and is that the only way to do Dolby Atmos is to do the 7.1.4 or are there other not. flavors? Okay. Absolutely not. So you can do 5.1.2, 7.1.2, 9.1.6, all the way up to somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 channels because Atmos is what we call object-oriented audio. Okay. And so it can scale up and down in software to know exactly what the system is. This system is programmed for 7.1.4 because that's what my system is. We actually decode it at 7.1.4 and save the files as 7.1.4. Or in the case of playing from Apple Music, it will output at most from the desktop. Now, it's not lossless, but it'll output it from the desktop, which is really nice, instead of having to have your phone hooked up. This display here is basically for demonstration and work. Normally, I have the display on my iPad, which is over at the listening position, so we actually control it with a piece of hardware and software called the Luna Display on the iPad. So some of these sound okay. bars can do a pseudo Atmos thing where they bounce sound around and things like that. Not as good as, you know, the individual speakers and amplification. Because your room needs to be calibrated and right. it needs to do a lot of processing to figure out how to bounce the sound off your ceiling and your walls to get that right. surround effect. And one of the things that's completely different about my system mm -hmm. that we built here is this isn't a video system. There is no video in this. This is audio so it's only. It's not a home theater. It's right? not a home it's theater. just for listening just to for listening Dolby to spatial audio music. Right. And so one of the things that's missing here is somewhere in, in the neighborhood of you know, two or three thousand dollars worth of to get a good surround processor. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't use that in this system. We use software that plays music on the Mac. We use the 12 channels of a digital analog converter here, and then we go a little further on. The DAC goes into a power amplifier for the 11 channels, and then of course the subwoofer has its own power. Tell me about how you were able to set up all the different speakers in the Mac. The Mac actually has a piece of software called Audio MIDI Setup. It allows you to configure the speakers as necessary. So I say my system is 7.1.4 Atmos, and it shows an isometric graph of where all the speakers are. And the 12 channels are programmed appropriately for Apple Music, what they call it, spatial audio, which is a form of Atmos to play to a 12-channel system. So under the configuration, you have different drop-downs. Do you just choose from a preset there, or right. do you have to? Yeah, there's a preset. Oh, so, so they have Atmos 5.1.2, 5.1.4, 7.1.2, 7.1.4, which is mine, and then they added this in the latest OS is 9.1.6. It also has some other types of just surround sound or just stereo. But in this case, the hardware here is configured for 7.1.4. That's 75% of the configuration for the Mac. And what are the different views that you could do? Okay, so here's a top view. So here you can see the ceiling speakers and where the surrounds are. They show the subwoofer over here. That's actually the wrong place to put Corner. the subwoofer yeah. for Atmos. And then there's a side view which shows it like this. 
Okay. So you can see the seven speakers at ear level that you're right. talking about, the one subwoofer, and then the four ceiling speakers up at the top. One little niggle that I have with the chair placement, according to Dolby Atmos, mm -hmm. this side speaker is actually supposed to be either right on or just behind your head, not in front of it. I just think that view is just a little off, but that's an absolute niggle. So you've got the different channels and it lists all the speakers along the left-hand side there in the list. Right. And then what are the list of channels there? Do those correspond to your audio interface? Yes, they correspond to the audio interface. So I'm using the first 12 channels of this audio interface to go out and you can change which channel it is, or you can turn a channel off if you want. This is the order they're in, and that's the order that I wired the system for, so it's the standard order here, mm -hmm. and then all the cables are labeled in that order so that it makes it really easy. I can look at this and see the order. And then there's a little test button just to make sure that everything's piped through correctly? Yes, there's better ways to do that. And when okay. we were first doing testing, we had a little fault that freaked us out a little bit. We will not emulate that fault again here, okay. but yeah. Okay, great. So you use audio MIDI setup to set up the surround system, assign all the speakers to the channel outputs on your audio interface. Mm -hmm. What else do you need to do? This is where you need one other piece of software to do everything that I'm doing correctly. I'm actually using two pieces of software, but we're just going to talk about the one. So to get all the audio piped to this audio device and to do what we call room correction and more, we have to use another driver for the Mac called the Black Hole Driver. And so Black Hole is a free piece of software and it creates a device that I can then pipe audio through. So, so Black it's, Hole creates a virtual audio device that correct. you could, it has an input and it has an output and it just allows you to route audio. I, I can route audio anywhere I want and the Black Hole driver is actually very easy to use. The second piece of software, it's a thing called a Convolver and maybe, uh, yes, okay, it's a piece of software that runs convolution filters. This little program down here is the host that runs the convolver. And so here it's set up and you can see the audio inputs and audio outputs. So the input comes down from the input. And if we look at the IO, the output is this piece of hardware and the input to this is the black hole 16 channel. That's the inputs and outputs. So that's the thing that lets me put this piece of software in the middle that does the all the HL yes convolver. hang loose convolver right okay and that's a VST three plugin it it's like. it absolutely is a VST plugin so let's talk about these corrections and what exactly are you correcting for are you correcting for time based anomalies frequency based this is where the magic of digital signal processing comes in it's mm -hmm. it's really amazing we measured the system in place a measurement microphone and a piece of software called Audio Lens XL. It plays the audio out to each one of the speakers and runs a sweep sound. Sine wave sweep? Yeah, it sweeps from, from 0 hertz to 45 kilohertz, I think is the way we said it. Maybe it was only 25. But anyway, from basically from DC to past what we can normally hear. The microphone is placed vertically right where your head is mm -hmm. and where the speakers are located because it's really important because one of the things you talked about is time-based correction. That software then records each channel, saves a file, which shows what the playback from the speakers looks like, each one in turn. And you can overlay them on top of each other. And, and then an expert looks at that data and then processes it and makes these convolution filters that do basically seven things. So the first thing, it looks at the speaker and looks at the output of the speaker and says, you know, that speaker's crossover is down a little bit here, or it's a little high over here. So the first thing it does is it helps correct and make that speaker output more flat. So okay. it corrects the frequency response of the speaker. So right. if you're going from 80 hertz up to 20 kilohertz, it tries to it, add EQ or cut it. It builds a multi-filter tap. It's actually there's 65,000 taps per channel. What's a tap? It's a place where it looks to make a change. So okay. 65,000 times. 65,000 little wedges that it can okay. look across the audio So 65,000 
different measurement points along the frequency spectrum. Right. Is what it's looking right. at. Right. We also tell the system where the speaker's cutoff is, the minus 3 dB points on the speaker, so high frequency and low frequency, so it knows the speaker's not going to put anything out below 40 hertz, or it's not going to put anything out below 80 hertz. In the case of these emit 50s that are the front channels here, Dynaudio emit 50s, they basically cut off at about 80 hertz. So we actually tell the digital signal processor, don't put any frequencies below 80 hertz to that, so it's called base offloading. All the speakers have different levels where they don't work as well. So we offload that base, and we're going to send that base to the subwoofer. And for the subwoofer, we do exactly the opposite, right? The subwoofer can't go above 200 hertz or above 500 hertz or whatever it is. We don't send anything to the subwoofer that would cause the subwoofer to distort or whatever. So basically, it's a high-pass filter for the main speakers and a low-pass low pass filter, filter for, for the, the subwoofer, sub. and that's right. how it does the crossover. And, and that, and it, so is the, that crossover adjustable? Like, can you pick it? Filter designer can pick the crossover. So in my system, it's 80 hertz for the big speakers and 40 hertz for all the rest, because that's 40 right. hertz is about where they all cut off. They're a little bit either way. Sure. And, and we have only done two passes at this, getting it aligned. So a person has to go in, look at the measurements, and actually create filters right. that correct for it. Right. So it's and not a fully automated process. No, this is a manual process, absolutely manual. And How long it, does it take? Mitch has been doing this for 20 years. And well, I, you haven't been setting this room up for 20 years. No, right now. but Mitch <laughs> has been doing this work for 20 years, and he turned my filters around to me in about four hours. Okay. Now, I don't know how much of that time was him working or whatever, but he turns it around pretty fast. So it takes him a couple of days to get it in. Of course, he can't hear my system, sure. right? But he can, he can look at it. He can see the measurements. He can yeah. see the measurements. He can look at it, and he can create the filters. So you've got some correction filters that go in for every single channel. You've got 12 channels of right. audio here. Each one has its own has correction its own. filter. Right. The one other thing that it does is it corrects, you mentioned before, for timing. So each speaker is a different distance. The DSP can actually adjust and delay so that all the speakers, the first instance of a wave, comes to your ears at the same time. Right. And it corrects for that. Yeah. That's a big deal. It is a big deal because I think the speed of sound, it travels at about, in one millisecond, about one foot. Right. Right. So if your speaker placement is off just a little bit, you can hear a slight difference there. And if you hear the same signal delayed by a millisecond, you sort of hear it as a spread out a little bit wider in the stereo field. It is amazing when you're at the train station and yeah. the train goes by and you hear that Doppler effect and all that, or you're out walking and the owl hoots off to the side or whatever, how well the human brain and ear can like zero in on right. that thing. And that's all timing. Because uh, our ears are not 12 inches apart. That's less than that. So that right. means we can tell the difference at least between a one millisecond difference in arrival time, if not a, a lot finer. Uh, apparently, a trained ear can actually get down into the six to seven microsecond range of differentials. Yeah. Well, up to 20 kilohertz. Up to right? 20 kil. So uh, up to, for... Yeah, we're not bats. That timing differential is something that really hurts a, the sound in your room. And so now, when this thing is playing back, it goes through this convolver filter. There's 12 channels, 32 bits deep. So it's a 32 bit sample. Is that what the source audio is? For no, no, Atmos, that's the or? filter. That's okay. that's the, the filter that's, is processing it in 32 uh, bit uh, precision. Bit. True HD Atmos, which is the lossless Atmos mm -hmm. that you can get off of a Blu-ray, for example, or off of some digital files that you can start to download now, which are starting to come out. That is 48 kilohertz sample rate and 24 bit word link. So there are 12 channels of 65, 536 filters running in the system in real time. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of math. <laughs> and all that runs on the Mac CPU? It all runs on the CPU. Yeah. Does it put a pretty heavy load on your system, or it, what is it, the it, CPU usage it, like it, when it, it's running? It's really funny. So this is the base M1 Mac Mini, right? Which uh, is pretty fast. Which yeah. is darn fast. And so when I'm doing a screen recording, which has got the, the screen recording software, I'm playing an Apple Music, and I put up Activity Monitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Activity Monitor is 2 or 3%. Screen recording is another 3 or 4%. And 
playing back 12 channels, the Mac Mini is running somewhere between 12 and 13% total use. Software playback, the convolution filters, and the other things running. And I've done nothing else. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, messages is running in the background or whatever. So we can see right now that HL Convolver host, that process, is using 71.8% CPU. And so it's just constantly running in the background there, it looks like. Yeah. It does take some background processing, but it's processing 12 channels of audio in real time, more or less, mm -hmm. at 24-bit word length, 48 kilohertz sampling rate, but at a precision of 32-bit. So it's doing a lot of math, right? Yep, To yep. apply those filters, time delays, and so forth. Is there anything else that you need to set up on the Mac to make Dolby Atmos playback work? Nope. That's it. Okay. That's it. For Apple Music playback. For Apple Music playback. Right. right. I do it differently for local files that are in 7.1.4 formats. We're going to use a different piece of software and a slightly different configuration for that. The music app can't play those other it, local it files? It will not play those. It will only play the lossy files that they have on the... The streaming, the streaming Dolby Atmos. Right. It only audio. plays those. Right. And so Apple Music is sending the Dolby Atmos sound to Black Hole. Right. And then the HL... Convolver app is actually taking the black hole audio output, processing, applying all these convolution filters to it, and then that is going to your Motu audio interface. And How did you have to wire this up to your speakers from the audio interface? Okay, so there's a bunch of wires out the back of this. There's a, a wire for every channel. It's a balanced output. Mm -hmm. So it's got two wires, a plus going wire and a negative going wire and a ground. So you wire those out the back. There's two different types of connections. I'm using what's called the Phoenix connectors, and there's three terminals that go on the wire, and then that goes up to an XLR connector on the amplifier. This is an XLR connector on the amplifier, so one's ground, one's one's plus, one's minus. Right. And that's, so did you hand wire, I hand -wire and solder all, all that? So yeah. You made your own cables. To well, actually, what's nice about these, this is from AudioQuest, and they actually have a crimper that crimps all three of these at once, oh. so there's no soldering. Nice. Yes, yes. You better make sure the wires are in there when you crimp, because you basically got one shot. Right. So it's a little, it's a little awkward. Uh. So three wires per channel, 12 channels, that's 36 different wires you have to worry about on both ends. On both ends. So yeah. that's 72 points of potential failure that yes. you have to worry yes. about yes. creating your own wires. And um, then, you have the speaker wires, too. Then you have the speaker wires. So beyond that, I guess talk to me about the speaker wires and how that's hooked up. Because you have an amplifier, right? These are passive speakers, so the right. amplifier is providing power to all the speakers. Right. There's a company called Evo, Emotiva mm -hmm. that makes uh, audio amplifiers. Uh, they make surround systems, etc. They make a cabinet which you can configure with different amplifier modules in it. So the cabinet I have is the 11 channel cabinet. So there's three single channel modules and four two channel modules. And the three single channel modules are for the left, right, center that needs the most power. And then the other four modules go to the left and right surround, left and right rear, the two front ceiling and the two rear ceiling. Okay. okay, so it's a modular amplifier chassis, and right. you can pick to have higher powered channels for the mains, the fronts, basically, okay. right. and then lower power amplifiers for the surrounds and ceiling. And typically, there is still more information and more power requirements on the front channels, still. That's typically where much right. of the audio is coming to you from. Just but, like if you go to a show, you're going to face the stage. You're not going to put your back to the stage, right? Right. Where the sound is coming right. from. But artists now can do something that's completely different that they've never been able to do before. Well, they've been able to do it, but not to the level of it. We are ingrained with stereo and somewhat mono sound where it, it comes as it. But now the artist can present sounds to you from anywhere they want. You can be immersed in the music, like Absolutely. sitting in the orchestra with or, musicians surrounding you. Or sitting in the middle of the rainstorm with the train going behind you, sure. or, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, create this whole immersive you, yeah, sound stage. Yeah, that's the new buzzword, right, is immersive audio. Yeah. 
That is absolutely fascinating. And the other thing that has started to happen, in 1972, mm -hmm. Aretha Franklin did this lovely album of her singing in a church, okay? And some, and I don't know what the tapes were, and I don't know who remixed it, but somebody remixed it in Atmos. And we'll get your reaction to listening to that uh, in Atmos a little later on and, and see what happens. But somebody took those tapes and remixed it in Atmos so that... It sounds like you were there. Sounds like you're sitting in the church. Sure, you're sitting in the church. Listening to Aretha Franklin. Yep, yep. Sitting up there. And, and the guy over on stage left in the third row in the balcony is going, go Aretha, and he's over there. Right. You know, that's absolutely fascinating. You can take somebody uh, like Brian Eno, who is now thinking about the presentation to be whatever he wants it to be, people now doing a better job of presenting the sound of the hall and the sound of the orchestra in that three-dimensional space and reproducing that three-dimensional space. So when you're listening to the orchestra, you get that sound like you're sitting in that chair in the hall. At engineering time, they can pick where you want to sit. And some people like front row center. I like row I, okay, just kind of halfway up in the back because then you, you get a little bit more of everything. So it would be interesting if someday we could have that so you could say, put me at E3, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, or that kind of stuff. Can't do that yet, but I, th I think those, those kinds of things are coming. Or I want to stand where the maestro's standing and hear the orchestra behind me or whatever. It'd just be fascinating to see what we can do with that. So there's lots of possibilities. Right. So what drove you to do all this, Bob? We've had a surround TV system upstairs, just a real simple sound bar and a couple of speakers. And I enjoy that a lot. And then you and I went to Expona this year. You did? Okay. And this gentleman has this device called the Immerse 360, Tiger Fox 360 Immerse 360, which is this wall that you wrap around yourself and you put two speakers in front of it, and you play the sound to you, and the shape of that brings out the surround sound of that out of a two-channel system. And so I have one of those, and then that triggered me to actually pay attention to what's going on in, I'll call it real immersive audio, where the sound is engineered to be placed where the artist and the engineer and everyone wants the sound to come from and how it wants to present it to you. I talked to some people about that and a bunch of people like what I've been writing. So a couple of folks came along and said, well, you write about it, use our speakers, let me know what you think and all that. And so sort of sponsored by these folks to do that. Emotiva, AudioQuest for cables and Dynaudio. They're Dynaudio speakers, they're not mine yet. <laughs> and the other thing that triggered it, it's the music itself. And I have an Atmos soundbar in the system upstairs. And the Berlin Philharmonic now broadcasts their concerts live and recorded mm -hmm. in Atmos over the internet. So now I can listen to the Berlin Philharmonic and watch the Berlin Philharmonic like I'm sitting in their hall. In the in concert Berlin, hall. In know. a concert hall, in my family room, in central Illinois, and they're in Germany. Wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, and it's all about the music for me. It really is about the music. The technology behind this, you know, everybody goes, oh, this is complicated. No, it's not. It's just some extra speakers. It's just, it's just, it's a, just few extra, speakers, it's right? a few more speakers. It's a few more speakers. Oh, and the space. You don't need 12 speakers, right? You could set it up with fewer channels. Right, absolutely. Um, or even more now. Right? Or even more. Or, or you could build now, a room and put 30 speakers in. <laughs> but the other thing is that you could also experience Dolby Atmos spatial audio with just a pair of headphones. Yes, right? absolutely. What is the difference between you listening to Dolby Atmos spatial audio content through a pair of headphones versus this system that you built here? I'm going to use a food analogy. Listening to Apple's lossy Atmos playback in headphones, to me, it's sort of like the first course of a fine seven-course meal. It's absolutely 
wonderful. It's perfectly prepared. It's just great, but it's only the first course. There's more to come. That's the way I feel about it. I love it. I enjoy listening to it. The experience is even there in the two-channel presentation on speakers out of laptops and stuff, out of like a phone. It builds this digital sound field around you. The Pixel can do it. The, um, the, the iPhone can do it. It's just amazing yeah. to me. And so that's all sort of a taste to go to this. And this is the real deal. This is absolutely the real deal. And in a fairly small space in a normal house, basically. Are there certain differences that you hear or feel when you're listening to a room system versus just through headphones? Yeah, specifically the bass, the lower end frequencies are much more impactful. Right, because uh, you actually feel it you actually, in your body. You actually feel it a little bit more in mm -hmm. your body. Where things come from different places around is much better defined. It's significantly better, but yet the experience in headphones is still very, very good. Yeah. I wouldn't give it up, okay, it's wonderful, but if I want to go to the next level, the next level is something like a good sound bar that will do some of it, or something like um, a system that we've built here. And I don't need video down here. This isn't for watching movies and yeah. you know, having the jet fly over. So you've talked about lossless Dolby Atmos Correct. files. How do you get those? Currently, there's there are two ways. You have a Blu-ray, and the audio is on the Blu-ray. Is this a Blu-ray movie, or do they actually sell audio on They actually days? sell, they used to have like DVD audio, you remember that maybe? Mm -hmm. These are audio Blu-rays that you can purchase. And then the files are delivered on an audio Blu-ray. and they Are come. they hard to find, or are uh, they They're few stores? and far between. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of sources on the internet of people starting to sell more and more of them. I've got one coming, which is a new release that'll be here in a month or so. So you can't really walk into a store and browse a whole bunch of Blu-ray audio discs? Not currently, no. Okay. I have the feeling that'll come along uh, over time. There's a lot of these box sets of mm -hmm. music that people have produced in the past few years, and some of them have Blu-ray audio. It seems like we're taking a big step back as far as technology goes. Are there any streaming services that offer lossless? Atmos? Not lossless. It's all lossy because you have to stuff 12 channels of 24-bit, 48 kilohertz data down the wire. Mm -hmm. And that's a little hard on streaming services currently. Two channel you can do, you can do the lossy stuff very well. No issues in lossy stuff. They're doing that to phones. That works very, very well. So even if you're not streaming, could you even download a lossless file? Not yet. There are two or three companies that are starting to, to deliver files that way. Mm -hmm. And it's not all Dolby Atmos. There's Aurora 3D. There's a couple of others out there. We're just using Atmos because it has the advantage that more of that is available on the Blu-ray formats. They can encode it in one of several different systems. So it's a little bit of Sony Betamax versus VHS right now. There's a little bit of that. So this is in its infancy. It's new. Yeah. So you have to order a Blu-ray lossless Atmos music disc. Disc. Right. From the internet. It yes. arrives. You have to take out the disc, and is that what this Blu-ray drive here that's, is that's for? That's what I do with that, and then you take the files off of that and put it on your hard drive, and then you can play that file in a bunch of different formats using the Dolby Player software, which you get from Dolby. Is it a simple file copy to take it off, or do you need special software? The, the to... DVD audio, they're typically what's called an MKV file. Okay. They typically deliver an MKV file, which you can just copy. Okay, right. so you just drag and drop the file over to your computer and right. then you can play the lossless file on there. With the Dolby Reference Player, yes. Okay, so you have to use the Dolby Reference Player for that and that's what you need the subscription for. Right. And there's right. currently no other... There's currently no other, other way that. to do that. So you have the subscription, but I don't play it that way. But it's a Blu-ray right. disc. Can you play it in a set-top Blu-ray player? Yes, some, okay. of, them, some of them do. The key to it is is that it has to have the Dolby decoder hardware or software in whatever's playing it back. Right. So in this case, it's an application running on the Mac. Okay. So drag and drop, you have some player software on there, and then it goes through the whole convoluter filter yep, and everything. Yep, can do that, absolutely. And it's the same thing. Since it's playing the Mac, I run it through Black Hole and do that. It's called Dolby Reference Player. 
it's meant to use in a studio. So you can say, I have my speaker output that I want right now is 7.1.4. I'm going to output the black hole. I'm going to use AC4, all the true HD decoder. I can pick the decoder I want. You can change your dynamic ranges and all of that. This gets really complicated to understand that. And then I can load a single file in here or a list of files in here and do that. So this is typically used in the studio so that they can create an output that they can listen to in the studio that is appropriate and they can scale up and down. And well, what's it sound like with a 5.1? So I can make the 5.1 output and all that. There's a whole bunch of other things that this can do. So what I do with this software is there's a script that we run, not on Mac. The script only runs on Windows. And that script drives this from command line interface, and it does all the work necessary to create a true HD multi-channel WAV file for my system. The Dolby decoder decodes it, and then it creates a 7.1.4 file for playback on my system. So it takes that MKV file, gives you a multi-channel WAV file. It gives me a multi-channel so WAV file. it's a single WAV file. Single WAV file, yes. And it's... More and then or I less can play that multiplex to of all 12 Yeah, children. and I can play that back with one of a couple of pieces of software on the Mac. Can you show any of those files? Sure, absolutely. Abso like? Yeah. So one of the things that's nice about the software I'm using is it will run the convolver inside of itself. I don't need to have black hole running. The piece of software I'm using is J River Media Center. Been around for a very very long time amazing piece of software that's actually rather complex to learn how to use mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people out there that can help you with it it's got a good community around it it's not expensive 50 or 100 dollars to purchase it so it's basically a media file player it's a media player. player. It plays audio or it will play video it will play audio it will okay. do all kinds of things so you I can am organize a library create playlists right. all that absolutely stuff. all of that kind of stuff there's even a little remote control app where you can remotely control it it can talk to remote libraries it is a very powerful very complex piece of software that I use in probably its simplest form, play music. What's the difference with J River Media that is the reason why you use it versus any other player, just like it Apple Music? It will play multi-channel files very nicely, and it will integrate the hang loose convolver I'm using. It has its own convolver, so I can put the convolution filters in it, but the Hang Loose Convolver has something that we haven't talked about yet, which is absolutely amazing. In real time, I have three sets of filters. So I have a set of filters which is pass-through, which just basically takes the 7.1.4 and shoves it to the speakers. It doesn't do any correction, just passes it through. Yep. Then there are two standards for audio playback. There's a Dolby standard and an EBU standard. And those have different hearing curves. And so I have a filter for the EBU curve. I have a filter for the Dolby curve. I have the filter which is passed through. And now I can these curves that you're talking about, are they loudness curves? Sort effectively of like a loudness Fletcher curve. Fletcher Munson or right. equal loudness curves? Right. Human perception curves right. for music playback in immersive audio. Specific standards for that. And they have a slightly different curve. This will play them back. In real time, I can A-B in real time with Mitch's convolver, with Hangloose convolver, between those three. Push a button, pass through, push a button. It's instantaneous. So this convolver... So you can hear the effect of what the filter is doing to your audio to absolutely. correct. Absolutely. No switching cables or shutting down, no delays or anything. In order to do that, it's running 16 channels of EBU, 16 channels of Dolby, and 16 channels of pass through at the same time. The level's fairly well matched, not perfectly matched yet, yeah. because as you know, if it's a little louder, it sounds better. If it's a little right. louder, it sounds better, and so I don't have it perfect yet, Right. because the convolver takes about 5 dB. It takes about 5 dB off of the signal. It okay. really does take a lot off. J River Media Center is really. what you use to play all of your mm -hmm. MKV files that you've basically decoded. Decoded to, to WAV Dolby. files to fit basically your speaker setup, Absolutely. Right? Because if I had a 
to set up. I wouldn't be able to use and play back using those files. You would, would not. Need. You could play it back, but it wouldn't sound right because the sounds would be. Well, there would be long. channels that don't, don't map have. to any speakers. Right. right, and the power of the Dolby encoder is to adapt. It does that in real time. It does that in real time right. and adapts. And so it's a brilliant piece of software. It right. really is, and, and the system design is absolutely brilliant. And so that decoder must also be built into other players like streaming services like Apple Music. Right, it is. Where it can decode based on your speaker setup that right. we saw in audio MIDI setup. Right, Apple does not include the True HD decoder in their operating system. True HD True. is the lossless encoder. Okay. Because so. they offer lossless music for... Two-channel. Stereo music, but not for Dolby Atmos. But not for Dolby Atmos. What is the original file format? It's the Dolby object format. It's these objects right. where you're building these files. You can say, create this guitar as an object, and take that object and put it left center. Or take that object and put it yeah. right. Many different objects, each with a different placement. So right. it could just depend on the engineer on how many objects that they had in the mix and where they placed it. Right. And so you can move this stuff around. It gives the engineer an amazing set of flexibility to create sound for us. Yeah. It's just, it's fabulous. These files that you've created, they will only work on any, any 7.1.4 system. system. If they okay. have a different speaker setup, you'd have to create a you'd totally to create, different file. You have to create a different one. And then of course, then the other custom thing is the filters we're using are specific to my system. The Convolver sure. filters yeah. are, those are, are, those are specific. We're looking at a playlist here. Mm -hmm. Is this a Dolby Atmos playlist? This is one album that's a two-channel album. We can see that the bitrate column, we're looking at... 4,608 kilobits. Okay, so four it's a, megabits. It's a 2496 file. J River has this concept of libraries, and what I did is I created two libraries. I have a two-channel library, so and I have an Atmos library. Okay, so we're gonna switch over to the Atmos library. These are lossless files. Those are the wave files that you created. Right. These are 24-bit, 48 kilohertz files. The bit rate now is only 13.8 13 .8 megabits right. per second. Well, it's not six times a stereo file. Right, but remember that stereo file was 2496. It was 24-bit, uh, 24 96. 96 kilohertz. So this is technically about three times. Uh, technically about three rate. times. The thing that everybody doesn't realize that this is a USB 2 interface. This is not USB 3. I don't need USB 3. This shoves USB 2 data. It's really so, amazing. On a fast broadband internet connection, you could stream that in you real could. time. But again, what is the file format that Dolby is using? And is that compressible? Is that kind of stuff? There's a lot of engineering that's going to go into that before we get lossless multi-channel playback to your yeah. home. Do you have an MKV file of yeah, any of so, these? I'm just curious, what is the file size difference between the two. The MKV file for this album is 1.83 gig. And is that the whole album in the WAV files that you have there? So the total size of those files is four gig. four gig? Four gig. Okay. A typical album, four gig. In WAV file, but the MKV was only 1.83 Right, because wait, it's wait. an audio file, right. not a Dolby encoded file. How long is this album? 48.49, 4.7 gig. For a one hour album, maybe it's about five, five gig gigabytes an album. for yeah. a lossless. True HD 7.1.4. Whereas the original Dolby encoded MKV file was only 1.8 gig. gigs. Right, yeah. So it made it bigger by decoding it. Right, absolutely. All right, so you've got some things in your album here in the J River Media, Media Center. Center. How do you use this? Walk me through that. We'll go over here and we'll actually start playing. Here's the VST plugin right there. You're not running Black Hole. The host program, the VST plugin, is running in Media Center. This is actually significantly less. If you look at the yeah. CPU load here, the HL Convolver app was using around 70. Yeah, it was running around 70 percent. Right. Overall, this machine is basically idling. So you're not going to totally max out your And your fans don't kick up or anything like that. Should we listen to some music now? Well, that's why we're here, isn't it? Right. All right. Yeah, go okay. over there and sit down. So we listened to the 1972 Aretha Franklin, and we have the, on Apple Music, you're able to listen to the two-channel version. That was the first track I listened to right. on your system. And uh -huh. I think the first thing that struck me was that, oh, the piano is like off 
to the side, like beyond the boundary of where the speakers are. And it right. was interesting to hear that placement of it. That was more of a realistic recreation of the space. Yes. And I like that. Yeah, yeah. I also liked other mixes where uh, it felt like the sound just enveloped you and it was very seamless and smooth. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that was interesting, we were, you were talking before we moved over here, in one of the tracks you were listening to, and it was coming out of the left and right surround speakers, and you go, that's not right. That's not right, it's just not what I want to hear. It broke the illusion. It's right. not that it wasn't right. Like, you could do whatever you want. To me, it just took me out of the, right. the song and the music. And that's what that artist picked, and, that, and that's fine to a certain extent. If you don't like it, you don't have to listen to it. What I love about what you can do with Atmos is it lets them experiment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we listened a little bit of uh, uh, Brian Eno's new album, and one of the things that, that set me off on that one that I just love is you walk from outside of the music envelope or the snow globe like a, the snow globe of music like a, and you come in and it just it, it, it's like you're walking into that bubble of sound it's just really cool to me i just mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoy that to a certain extent you need minimum space right right, right. to set this up if you have furniture in the way it does kind of limit where you can put right. furniture because the speakers have to be placed in certain locations right the other thing i would point out is that if anyone is thinking about setting up a surround system like this, the sweet spot is really just like right here. Especially it, once you do the room corrections, right. everything is tuned for this exact spot right where here. you are sitting right now. To me, that's a limiting factor. I agree with you. Nobody in the, else in this household is probably as, as interested or as excited about this as I am. You can scale this up and scale the sweet spot up. You can, cha you can do this. We're in... 12 feet wide by 15 feet long by seven and a half feet. That's the space this is in. Right. To put two chairs beside it ourselves in here, you're going to off balance things. Now, if you've got a little bit more room and you use in wall speakers and in ceiling speakers, you start getting it and you can scale this up and down, mm. but it requires knowledge, some engineering work, stuff like that. You got to cut. If you're doing in wall speakers, you got to cut holes in the walls. You got to run wires in the walls. Right. Fortunately, here I have four speakers in the ceiling. It's a raised ceiling. It was very easy to do that. But the sound is just, to me, it's completely different and it's extremely enjoyable. I call this the simplest, most complicated system I've ever built yeah. because there's not a lot of components here. And you've got your iPad here to remote right, control so, your Mac Mini over there. Yeah, the iPad's here. I can just press play right here and the music will start playing and, and do all that. The most complicated part in my mind is the corrections. How critical do you think that is? Because, you know, getting a multi-channel audio interface isn't that difficult. Getting a few powered speakers, even smaller ones, right? Oh, yeah. To put them around your room. That's fairly basic, yeah. but the corrections, how critical is that to the system, in your opinion? I think it is step three. Step one is deciding to do it. Step two is implementing it. And step three is actually going out and doing that. And Do you think it's mandatory in order for somebody to get the benefits of... No, no, no. It's not mandatory, but the difference to me mm -hmm. is absolutely worth the the effort cool well thanks so much for sharing your you. system with me and i'm, I'm glad you're listening. able to come over again we haven't seen each other much lately so yeah. it's good to have you by we'll see you next time on the three techs